Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session. So today we are honored to have Lil as well as Marius to join us to present on their symbolic AI architecture. So I shall I met Lil on the Machine Learning Street Talk Discord, and we were talking quite a lot about all this latest technologies in AI. And I'm very excited about his work because it combines the current trends of large language models to interface with some symbolic tools. And so this overall framework is called a neural symbolic framework. And I'll leave them to introduce you how it works. So just some brief introduction. Leo is currently an applied scientist for Amazon devices. His main expertise lies in the field of deep learning. And his most recent focus is that of large language models. As for Marius, he's currently working as a senior AI research scientist at Atlas and also is a PhD student at the Institute of Machine Learning at Johannes Kepler University in Linz. His main expertise lies in the field of deep reinforcement learning, same as me, <laughs> domain adaptation, and the study of neurosymbolic AI. So first up, if you haven't already seen their repository, this is the symbolic AI repository. And this, basically, you can see from this little clip over here, you can use it to express things in symbols, and you can use the symbols to do many things, like translation, extraction, of and search the web, SQL queries. In fact, it is interfacing the large language models input of this to extract and use the relevant tools, symbolic tools, in order to fulfill your requests. All right, so without further ado, I shall hand over time to Leo to describe more about the architecture. Okay, Leo, please. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. All good. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see it? Yep, E to the power AI. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we were thinking to uh, have to to um, to part. I will I will do like a, an introduction part, in which I will talk about uh, maybe some theoretical aspects and and why we were uh, this, developing this framework. And uh, I wanted to give you some uh, motivation and uh, intuitions into into some of these underlying concepts. I will have to say sorry in advance uh, I, if I would probably go uh, very fast over over some of them. But uh, if you have questions, please um, note them down, and and or we will have a Q Q and A session at the end, and uh, we we can discuss them if if there is something that uh, won't be clear. Uh, so uh, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> why solving language? Uh, a lot of people might, might ask why, why solving language is kind of important. So uh, in a way, uh, because the limits of my language mean the limits of my world, which is a quote from a famous philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, and it's something that resonates deeply, deeply with me and uh, with, with the current uh, zeitgeist that uh, all of us uh, are seeing. So to ground you with an example, I just want to, um, to, to, to ask you to imagine something that probably happened to, to all of you uh, in your current lifetimes. Probably it will happen if it didn't happen already, uh, which is the fact that uh, at some point we might all be a tourist in a, in a foreign country, right? And you, you don't speak that language and you don't understand it. So how would you uh, communicate and, and speak with, uh, with another person, given that you do not understand and speak his language and he might not uh, understand the language that you speak into? So as you, as you might uh, see easily the problem here, and it's something that very often happens even if you're trying to learn a new language. And uh, this, uh, this issue that uh, we are seeing here is, is coming from the fact that we, are usually trying to understand a new language through our own native language. So we are doing some sort of translation uh, in our head. We, we just move back and forth between the two languages and we root it in our native language. So if you think about this, uh, this just this translation, you might 
be able to find out and there are people who studied this there, there's there is a philosopher uh, by the by the name of queen uh, which in his thesis which is called word and object he discussed a very important uh, problem of translation which is uh, which goes by the name of uh, um, the uh, indeterminacy of reference and what he meant by this is that there is no way for me as a as a as a speaker that is trying to understand your language, there is no way for me to uh, come up with all the possible interpretations that uh, there might be for words and phrases and sentences that are taken out of context. And he gave a very interesting example to point this out. He uh, basically asked asked you to imagine that you are with a tribe of people uh, that, that uh, let's say. Uh, that there are a lot of discussion going about the Piraya people, which is uh, a very a very famous example in the in the field of linguistics because apparently they they don't speak languages the way we 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 are familiar with. So imagine you are with them on a field and they are suddenly uh, starting to point out to something, and they are starting to say a word. So you might easily uh, let's say. Uh, infer that that word stands for the animal, right? Let's say it's a rabbit. So it might point to the rabbit, but how are you sure that that's what he actually meant? It might be the case that he was actually pointing towards the uh, act of hunting, and he he was asking you to participate in this act of hunting. And this is just one problem that is happening in in, in natural languages, which is this translation issue. There are much more. That, uh, that lie hidden and without even any effort, you can even by uh, standing over a tea in town and just think about language, you might start uh, coming up with interesting question. And one of them, which really caught my attention, and it's probably one of the reasons like I got into this, is um, how do you come up with the words, right? W when you speak, uh, how do they come out? So this is, uh, a very interesting problem because it points towards uh, it's a, it, it makes an obvious observation if you think about it uh, uh, for some time, and it points to the fact that language seems generative in, in a way because words seems to come out. You don't know why they are coming like this; they just pop out, and you apparently can make sentences and phrases and so on. So. <clears throat> Like you, uh, a very distinguished uh, fellow by the name of Noam Chomsky, uh, in '55, when he presented his uh, PhD thesis, at that point, he basically uh, tried to to capture this uh, uh, this uh, this thing by studying grammar. So he studied grammars, uh, and the way he studied grammars and the way he thought about grammars was as being a set of rules, which you basically combine. And by combining them, you are coming up with new sentences and, and you can further combine them uh, by taking these existing sentences and making new ones. So this was very uh, revolutionary work uh, at that time. And you will see uh, further down the presentation why. Uh, and in one year, so one year goes by and he comes up with something that really uh, changed everything in, in linguistics. And I will show you in the next slide that it's not only linguistics, it's like it's pervasive. It goes even into computer science and uh, it's, it's, it's a topic that lies at the heart of, uh, of your, comp your personal computers and it goes from parsers to compilers and it's, it's, it's in everything. So even if you would, built like a new programming language and you wouldn't know at all. You have never heard in your life about Chomsky and Chomsky hierarchy. You would still discover in a way by yourself because of the guidelines of how you build programming language and so on, you would inevitably go over the same process. You would actually discover it by yourself. So uh, in, on, on, this, on the slide, you can see that um, there, are some, there are some circles and Probably the, the obvious uh, thing that you might observe is that there is a center. Uh, and from that center, you can expand outwards. So it's a type three uh, grammar because he studied grammars. 
Um, and he basically uh, thought about uh, a very simple thing, if you, if you, if you, if you can uh, see it like this. He basically asked himself, how uh, can I come with, come with a very restrictive set of rules, like something that would not allow me to do much, and just build up from there? And this is exactly the type three uh, uh, grammar that he initially studied. And all he did then was to remove one restriction at a time. And by removing this kind of restrictions, you just expand outwards towards more general kind of grammars. Okay. I will give you a little bit uh, of a, a little sneak peek into some uh, formal properties of grammars, which it shouldn't be that complicated to 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 get. The, basically, a grammar has uh, what they call production rules, and you have to think like uh, like uh, a, a direction. It goes from uh, LHS means left hand side, and it goes from left hand side to the right hand side. What this means basically is that you just replace the left hand side with the right hand side. So this is a rule. Okay, and this rules apply to non-terminal symbols, which is a, a finite set, finite set of non-terminal symbols, and you also have like a set of non-terminal symbols to which this rule uh, do not apply. You can think about them like a, a stop criteria. It's, it's when you when your constraint is satisfied and, and you will just stop. You will not produce anymore, and it also has like a start symbol which is part of this finite set, set of non-terminal symbols in, in the, the way it's, it's, it's standing by itself because it has a, a more distinguished uh, um, reputation because it just starts uh, this whole generation process. And the way you choose the start symbol will define what kind of uh, path you would take uh, in building this kind of grammar. So because I, I told you that what Chomsky studied was uh, grammars, and obviously grammars, in his case, uh, was connected to the study of languages. And his simple idea was because language was a generative process, he studied grammars, which are the rules of combining words, and by combining uh, words and evolving these uh, rules, you come up with languages, okay? but. This is not the whole picture. Uh, people, uh, very smart people from computer science has seen uh, uh, an intuitive connection with their, with their field. And more specifically, the automaton uh, 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 theory, which is a theory of computation. And they immediately started to uh, do again, the same obvious thing. How can I take this grammar, which produces this language and put it into a computer. This is what they did. And they come up uh, with uh, ways of, of mapping grammars and languages to computers. And this, as you may think, emerged, emerged as uh, programming languages and parts and compilers and so on. And I, and I wanted to show you a little bit how this uh, uh, mapping and how this tables feel itself. So at the most restrictive kind of language that you can you can have, as I said, is, is type three, which is which creates uh, uh, regular languages, and a regular language is um, is it's a very simple thing. It's, for example, the set of regular expressions, right? So if you write a regular expression, and if you ever wrote a regular expression, regular expressions are a language defined by uh, the type three grammar, which Chomsky studied initially. And this, um, this obviously maps to, uh, to uh, the computation side of things to a finite state automata, which usually doesn't have any memory, because if you think about it, uh, regular expressions are local. They do not involve the use of any memory. They just uh, happens to be, you just match things and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, but if you, and I, I also, there's also some examples here. For example, the left-hand side of this, uh, of, of the production rule is a single variable and the right-hand side is either a single word or it's a word plus some variable, 
Okay, so S here stands for um, the start symbol, the one that it's the distinguished symbol from from the from the from the properties of a grammar. It's with it, for example, you would replace X. So first thing that you would do is to go from from S to X. So that's one replacement you can do. You can also do another type of replacement, which is take S and replace it with AX, and so on. And then you have might have another rule which would tell you how you would replace X or how would you replace A. And you just keep doing this thing and you just evolve them and see what kind of things you can discover. So this is the type three grammar. It gives you regular expressions in, in, in computer science. There's also the type two grammar, which has the name of, which creates context-free uh, uh, languages, which is usually the kind of, of languages that uh, you might uh, get in in computer science, like I don't know, many languages are, are here. Many programming languages lie exactly in in this uh, in this category. And the difference between uh, type T and type two is the fact that you augment your automaton with a stack memory, which is a very simple uh, type of memory. It is it, it basically implies that you just uh, uh, it, it it functions by the uh, last in first out. So if you know the classical uh, Tower of Hanoi problem, it's it's the same thing. You just remove the first one, and then you you, to, to, you have to get to the to the second one. Have to take the first one, and so on. So this is a stack, and the stack obviously has a push and a pop that you can do. So these are the operations that you can do, and the grammar uh, creates this context-free languages, which. Uh, as you can see, the restriction uh, applied on this kind of of, uh, of grammars is uh, they are basically taking a symbol on the left hand side, it, which is a single variable again, and you can just create a much uh, complicated, uh, less restrictive kind of uh, of sentence or production rule, because you can create uh, you can you can no longer say that it's a single word. To the to the right, you, you can make it much more complicated. Then you have the type one uh, grammars, which create context sensitive languages. Context sensitive languages, uh, if you think about it, uh, you can think about it this way. So context implies that you have to uh, on the on the left hand side of the rule, you would get this rule by only matching. Uh, the, let's say the star symbol with constituent elements by on his left side, right side, whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. But context is exactly what you would expect. It's like it's like condition. This rule exists given that it has the star symbol and it has another symbol to his its left side or or right side. And as you can imagine, these languages are less restrictive and are more complex than than the previous ones. And they map usually in computer science to a linear bounded automata, which uses bounded RAM, random access memory, which is a way of, of saying that uh, it's basically your, your memory from your computer, your personal computer is the same memory. It's a different kind of memory than a, a push down a stack automata, which is a stack memory, because you can access uh, random uh, points and cells in this memory and it's obviously much more powerful than a stock memory. And <clears throat> by moving one step up, you would reach the type zero, which is the most general type of, of, of grammar that you can come up with. Uh, it has the characteristic of being a recursive in the sense, a, a recursive uh, in this context means that it can terminate. So you, you would not go at uh, infinitum with productions with production rule. You, you will you will guarantee it to terminate at some point. There are also recursively enumerable type of languages also emerging from a type zero grammar, which would loop forever. And you have here the famous uh, halting problem uh, that uh, Turing study and so on. But this is just like a, a short and brief picture of what the Chomsky hierarchy is. I just wanted to take the gist of it and, and think of of grammars creating languages and computer scientists coming uh, into this field and basically taking this 
languages and putting them into a computer. This is the way and the normal progression that you should have in mind when you hear Chomsky hierarchy. This is what it does. But as you would expect, with very uh, interesting paradigm in, 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 in computer science and so on, this is not the, the only picture. And um, there was a, another uh, person who uh, created an entire field called information theory. He is the father of information theory. It's Claude Shannon. And he studied uh, language from a different perspective. He was not thinking in terms of set of rules and grammars and, and, and so on. He just looked at the uh, frequency and, and, and took a statistical approach to, to developing language. And he, he beautifully uh, stated in his paper, which is uh, called Prediction and Entropy of Printed English. It was published in 51. So it was kind of four years before Chomsky Chomsky's work. So, like, you, you can think of Chomsky reacting to uh, this uh, this whole uh, emergent uh, field of statistical learning and statistical tools in natural language processing. He was reacting to this in a way. So, he put it very nicely that you can, I mean, you can assume right that anyone who speaks a language possesses an enormous knowledge of the statistics of this language. This is. Uh, without a doubt, something that uh, it's true. Uh, to what degree is true, it's something that is, it's, is debatable, but it's an obvious assumption that you can make about language and how do we use language. And uh, he came up with a game, uh, which is Shannon's guessing game. And the way he thought about it to study, it was very simple. He just took a sentence and he just, ask you to fill in the gaps. There is also a game, I, I don't know if you played it as a, as a child, I did. It's called a hanging man, where you just, uh, you, you just uh, do this, exactly this problem. It's exactly this problem, but you solve it as a child, and any time you miss a word, then you just draw a hand and so on, until you, until you hang the man. Uh, yeah, very peculiar type of game, if you ask me. But we played it as, as children, in, in my case. So, obviously, by starting this, you would you would come up with uh, with the actual sentence, so you discover uh, how the sentence should look like by making guesses. That's why it's called Shannon's guessing game. But when you make guesses, a lot of things are going on, and this was his intuition that a lot of things should going on here because, as he said, it's not only like there are not only grammars and, and things like this there, there's also the underlying statistical um, uh, st statistical properties of language which is how words relate to one another and so on it, it's they are very important to be taking into account and he discovered something very important in 51 by the way that english should have between 0 0.6 and 1.3 bits per character so this is the amount of uh, surprise or entropy that you should have for a given English character from the alphabet, okay? So this points to something that uh, I found very interesting and I, I was thinking about it like a lot, which is data to information ratio. Uh, if you never heard about this concept before, data to information ratio is just a way to study how much data would you need to extract useful information. So for example, in our case as humans, we don't need a lot of examples, right? You usually, I show you something once and you can immediately uh, uncover the, the information. So this is very important. Computers cannot do this very easily. And Marius will, will discuss more about uh, uh, in context learning and, and so on. Uh, but to the machines, it's, it's, we kind of breached the gap right now. We are narrowing it. But data to information is just a concept that would tell you how much data would you need to extract useful information. And the, the thing to, to have in mind here is that rules exist. So the, the Chomsky rules that he discovered and thought about 
they exist, but from a practical standpoint, they get drowned by noise. So what is this noise? And I'm giving you here like two examples and the way I think about them. It's uh, on, on the left side, there is the famous ImageNet data set. So if you would put your uh, informatic, inf informatic theoretical lenses and study this, uh, this subject uh, from, this, from this point of view, you would very easily start to, to find out that by having 1000 classes in this data set, you would basically, but implicitly by the way this data set was designed, you would get only 10 bits of information per class. So just imagine this, you, you have all those billions of pixels per, per class, right? For, for each images from a specific class out of the thousand, you have billions of pixels and you only need uh, one, uh, one 10, uh, 10 bits length uh, long uh, uh, binary number to encode all this information. So as you can see, it, it's, it's a huge, uh, it's a high data to information domain, uh, the, the image domain. And the same thing is applied to, uh, for example, to language. Uh, take these numbers with a grain of salt. Um, I, I don't expect them to be actually uh, accurate, but it should be right there. I mean, it, they, should, they should come up right, right around this number. This is, for example, for GPT-2. And um, this wiki text data set has 28,000 Wikipedia articles which were curated and cleaned and, and so on. Uh, and they found out that actually the amount of information per character is roughly one bit. So if you think about uh, words in English, they would have like an average of, of five, of five uh, characters per, uh, per word. So that would be like five bits per word in, in the English. Uh, given this data set. So as you can see, it's a huge uh, data to information ratio. And this is exactly why these models, like the ones that we are building in deep learning, are so good. That's why you would never be able to design, even though they try and they failed in the 80s. That's why it's not possible to design rules, to capture all the rules of how you uh, how you distinguish one class from the other. So this is why uh, deep learning shines, exactly because there is a high data domain. And even though the information is relatively small, you can still recover it. Uh, there's also a, a lot of redundancy in the, in the, in the English, for example. Uh, I, I, I bet you can all read this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this phrases. And this only points to the fact that you, you don't need much to read. You, you just need like the first and last word to be last, uh, uh, first and last uh, character to be in the right place. And then you can mingle around with, uh, with what's in between and you can actually read it. Your, your brain is like, um, um, is doing this self-correction. And if this would have been a live session, I would have asked you how many of you think that GPT solved this kind of problem, but we are not live. So I, I will just tell you what happened in, in the last session that I held. So they, they were skeptical about if, if it solved it or not, but not only it is solved it, it can actually give you the answer exactly like this. So it understands this specifically this problem. You can, you can test it if you want. So ultimately, this is a story about statistics. It seems that it's all statistics. With ChatGPT and, and all these uh, emerging generative models, it is all statistics in itself. So in a way, it's all Shannon all over the place, less Chomsky and a lot of Shannon. But is it clever statistics? I, I would ask. And the answer is obviously not. It's just a very raw and basic way of doing statistics. You just predict the ne next word or, or the next token in this case. And I very much like this, this quote from, uh, from uh, uh, John von Neumann, which said that with four parameters, I can fit an elephant, and with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. What he tried to convey with this, with this message is that in physics, if you would go with uh, four parameters to your 
uh, to a four parameter theory or model to your professor, he would just tell you to choose another professor. He won't work with you anymore. Because if you take a, a five order polynomial, you can very easily um, overfit the data and you can fit whatever you want with an order five polynomial. Now, deep learning is exactly the, the reverse of this. It's actually billions of parameters to fit an elephant. So it's not only five, they use billions. So apparently it's useful to use this kind of thing. So John von Neumann, uh, even though it doesn't apply in physics necessarily, it had the point which the deep learning domain proved it wrong, that where there is high data to information uh, ratio, deep learning is very good. And it, you should have a lot of parameters. You just scale the models up and, and so on the data set and you just do better. So there is this uh, uh, thing which uh, was discussed by Judy Pearl. And if any of you took any course in, in Bayesian statistics, uh, the first thing you will find out is if one thing the professor will only tell you is that causes don't lie in the data. And you as a, as a scientist should study uh, the implications of the data by building causal graph and checking by wiggling one parameter, how does your data respond to it and so on. So this book, the book of why, I highly recommend it to uh, everyone. It's, it's a very interesting book because he came up with this uh, ladder of causality, which, um, and on which we are currently only on the, on the first uh, level, which he called the association or the seeing level. So you just look at the data, which is exactly what models uh, currently do, and you just uh, create associations, correlations, and there's nothing causal there. You just look for patterns. And that's it. Now, if you want to build uh, more advanced things like we humans do, and the Bayesian statistics is one of them, is you can create interventions. As I said, you can build a causal graph, you go in, you just wiggle a, 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 vari a variable and you see how data responds to it. So this is a very powerful technique which the current AI models don't uh, do very well. Probably there are some who do, and with the advent of GPT-4, they will do some of these things, but don't expect this to happen like over the night. It, it's a very hard problem. And the next ladder, which he, he was thinking about it in terms of creativity and where the, uh, our faculties of reasons lie and, and so on, would be this domain of counterfactuals, which would just be asking yourself what if questions. So you not only modify your graph, your causal graph, you would go beyond this causal graph and you would actually ask what would happen if I would put one more variable into my graph? How would the data change? So you can change this, uh, this, this initial graph behavior by putting uh, additional parameters in, to see how exactly uh, the, this, this, uh, uh, this whole data set that you, would, you have would react to, to, to it. So this is the domain of counterfactual. So I would say as a conclusion that it's, it's not uh, clever statistics, it's just the dumbest way of doing statistics, but it just works very well, apparently. Um, as you would expect, uh, and, and there is this a very interesting uh, essay uh, wrote by uh, Peter Norvik, which I highly recommend to read, and because it summarizes the points of Chomsky and the points of the statistical uh, culture people, and you can see exactly where things might go wrong and so on. And as you would expect, uh, obviously there is a there is a clash between the two uh, between the two domains. Uh, and uh, as I told you before, Chomsky was, uh, had a reactionary work and he came and, uh, with, with a response to uh, these statistical models. Um, but I, I won't go too much into it. I just wanted to mention it. It's a, it's a very interesting read. Just give it a try. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before giving it to Marius is what is a symbol? And as you can think, one way to think about it is a symbol evolving in time. So this would show you, for example, on the, on the left-hand side is the evolution of the English alphabet, and you can see how it evolved through time. So you can 
just by looking at this, you can see that obviously symbols change a lot and different events in times and, and, and different historical contexts will give you a different meaning to a symbol. So symbols obviously change. So whatever you do right now with your transformer, you would only capture the meaning up until this point. If I would ask you uh, to, to do the same uh, thing over 1,000 years, in 1,000 years, a lot would have evolved in terms of uh, how language, probably a new language will come up and so on. So you would need to, if you would have the same tools as today, you would just have to retrain everything and just put those 1,000 years into your models to get this out of it because it's not in. The, the, the current models don't have this. And one interesting uh, um, definition of symbol is that they are entities that mean something to someone. It's a very practical definition of symbols and it's one that you can uh, work up with and you can basically define a symbolic behavior on top of the symbols, which have some uh, properties. Uh, for example, I listed some here. For example, a, a symbolic behavior should be uh, should exhibit receptiveness to you, should appreciate conventions and, uh, and uh, receive new ones. It should be constructive for new conventions. It should be embedded. So you should be part of, the, of a broader system and contribute to the system that you're part of. It should be subject to change, obviously, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side in, in that graph. Uh, it should be meaningful, so it, it displays semantics. And not only display semantics, you, you should use those semantics to actually explain why did you came up with the semantics. So it's a very um, uh, interesting characteristic of, of, of semantics that you can use it to explain uh, what semantic is. Uh, so it depends on itself in a way. And obviously it's graded, right? I mean, there, there are no binary things usually. I mean, there are, but you should never assume a thing is binary uh, and, and start from there, you should always probably in the back of your mind have something like a, a more fuzzy system and graded here just means um, how, for example, would you grade chat GPT? And you would see that chat GPT is uh, graded by looking at how good is it with math? How good is it with creative writing and so on? So, uh, sorry, okay. So I, I put this uh, on the right uh, side of, uh, of the properties. So where do I think current large language models? Not only me, because I had inspiration from this DeepMind paper, which I also recommend to, to read. Uh, obviously they have receptiveness. So this is the strongest point right now. They just take into conventions and, they, and very easily receive new ones. If you do in context learning, you can give it new conventions that it should adhere to. And, an instruction is a way of receiving new conventions in a large language model. Are they constructing and subject to change? No, I would say not at all. They don't form new conventions and they do not change. Uh, they, they don't understand how a meaning change. You can do things and models will, will show, will, will explain uh, our, when it will turn our frame when you will see the power of, of sim neurosymbolic approaches in this case. But obviously they are not uh, malleable and constructive. Uh, are they embedded, meaningful and graded? Somewhat, yes, it's, it's a maybe, it's a big uh, maybe gr graded kind of more towards yes, because they, they evaluated the system over mathematics, language, creative writing, uh, how well it, is this toxic, is it, and so on. It, it's not binary. They are not asking, is this a good sentence or not? You are really looking into much more than this. So is it in a way graded, but it doesn't come with its own goals and, and things like this, which would make it fully graded to properly evaluate itself. We, we've seen some recent work into this direction, but it's, we are not fully there. And embedded and meaningful, I would say it's, it's again debatable because apparently just capturing syntactic uh, rules, it's giving you a lot. So there is an argument in, in, the, in the research uh, field of, of computational linguistics in which people came and said that large language models are just stochastic parrots. So they just uh, reproduce and come back with an answer. 
But it's clearly that it, it, by no means you evaluate their hypothesis, but it's obviously, it's, it's much more than that because capturing syntactic, uh, syntactic rules like in, in grammar in, in, in itself apparently seems enough to come up with meaningful sentences and so on. So they lack something in their hypothesis. And this is very important to be taking into account. Now, how would you use a symbol, for example? And a huge inspiration for us was uh, this, this paper, which is Search and Reasoning in Problem Solving uh, of uh, uh, Herbert Simon, which was published in 1983, in which he discussed this triad of, uh, of, uh, of, of three different elements, like how they combine together. And he, dis he came up with a, th a thing that he called symbolic structures, which would define your search space. And this symbolic structure, you can think about them as nodes, and you just traverse this uh, space that you created with the symbolic structures. Uh, it also has reasoning, and by reasoning, he meant more towards the formal language kind of things, uh, like context-free, context-sensitive, and the ones that I discussed before, in which you have axioms and, and you can build expressions. And also, uh, another point uh, that is very important to him is the one about constraint satisfaction, which is a way to narrow your domain when you are searching that, that huge space. So he said in his famous uh, Turing Award lecture together with Alan Newell that symbols lie at the root of intelligent action. And not only this, he actually uh, went further and said that the symbol may be used to designate any expression whatsoever. So. With this in mind, uh, I just give you a last thought from, uh, from the famous Judea Paul. And, and this, this thought is that you cannot answer a question that you cannot uh, answer a question that you cannot ask, and you cannot ask a question that you have no words for. So without further ado, I'll give the, the mic to, to Marius to show you how do we use symbols and where do this come into play? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, you have to stop sharing, I think. Yeah. I just uh, don't see it. Uh, where's the pop-up? Uh, you have to click on the stop share button. Yeah, but it's not here. Okay. Let me just uh, force stop share. All right. <laughs> yeah, for, for, for <laughs> stop share. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let, give, give me a while. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, yeah, that was a very Thank good you. theoretical introduction to what's a symbol. So now Marius will talk more about the symbolic AI framework. So uh, please go so, ahead. Thank you. You should see my screen, like a full screen, right? Somebody. Um, I think someone is turned on. Um, thank you. So you should see now my screen, symbolic AI framework, right? And nothing else. Yes, no, someone. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, so thank you, uh, Leo. And now, well, one of the things that you probably also followed up on, on Twitter and uh, was hilarious always to watch is uh, like the perspective of end-to-end -end learning and just statistical driven uh, part, like that, that's enough, uh, just scale up the data, scale up the models. Or on the, like in the past, it was, uh, um, you know, in the, in the 80s and so on, we had these uh, things where, we want template-driven development, so we had like uh, always abstraction and trying trying to find uh, more and more and better abstractions, such that we can you know solve more and broader and broader tasks. So on one ballpark, on one side, you had the software engineering uh, approaches uh, up until the 80s and so on, dominating. Uh, from the 90s onwards, you had kind of the statistical models, uh, connections models, kind of evolved, um, and we, nowadays we're kind of evolving also to the foundational uh, models. Uh, but instead of seeing those two like realms uh, uh, apart, uh, one of the ideas what the framework kind of what, what wanted to what we wanted to introduce is to bring both worlds a bit together and have a more uh, gradual or spectral way of interleaving between both worlds, uh, which is which is like the between programming having control where we have logic and everything that we have like from formal languages, but on the other hand, uh, use the power of generalization from uh, like models. Uh, to 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 find you know structural uh, patterns in the data because they're really good pattern recognition engines. Um, and actually, this project started off uh, after somewhere 
like GPT-3 towards GPT, uh, chat GPT in September last year, uh, where uh, when it came out, uh, there were immediately some limitations. Uh, see, but it was amazing, the progress and so on. Uh, but you, you, the still uh, back then, at least ChatGPT was not able, for instance, if you queried it, uh, data that was more recent than 2021 or so, it was not able to, you know, um, give you a reply on that. Uh, and in general, there is actually an inherent problem of, let's say, uh, causality, for instance. We People were always saying, like, look, this is no causal structure because it's just statistics in the end. Um, uh, or, for instance, adaptability, like I said, with the retrieval of information that is more recent, or even if with the limited context size. So if you, like, try to make a storytelling and then you, you just evade the, the context limit of the of the LLM, uh, well, you will probably forget your main protagonist and everything that was like beforehand. Uh, so, um, and one of the things that we ask is like, first of all, why do we have to store all the facts uh, in, in the weight space? Because well, I mean, you don't know all the knowledge of Wikipedia and you don't know all the knowledge of the world and so on. And this updated, like updates regularly in the news and so on. So you just look it up every time. And if you're interested, then you maybe look it up multiple times until you memorize it, but actually you know where to look for. Um, we saw this now obviously integrate with Bing and other engines that they're kind of combining these ideas already in the meantime. Um, and uh, we also saw like follow-up publications. Uh, so after the release of our framework somewhere mid January, uh, also papers came out like the two former showing that you can basically um, instruct the models to ask questions about like what kind of sources uh, they, do they have to query to to get the answers from is it a question answering a problem is it maybe a calculator that can solve this problem or any any, any other um, uh, source for, for the information to retrieve from uh, and just rewrite the answer afterwards so basically you get some input you kind of just classify if you want so if you should classify the input uh, and then you basically just select the tools do the computation and then just rewrite the answer um, and as I said already before, also our lab is going more in these directions you know, of, of, of like broad AI, uh, where up until the 80s, like I said, it was like very dominating the symbolic AI world uh, where we had uh, you know, all these this perks that we use today, compilers, everything that kind of the, the groundwork that was built up comes from that, from that time. Um, but there has been an inherent limitation, obviously, to generalization. Still, you cannot, uh, as many regexes and templates as you build, you still cannot really find all the comp like all the variations of it, right? Um, now we had this domination, so especially since the breakthrough in 12, uh, 2012, uh, that like, yeah, we uh, neural networks are the things, right? Uh, so we go just this way. Uh, but actually, uh, the, the the path that we're following now is the more the idea of the broad AI uh, movement. So away from this what we call now narrow AI, uh, just having you know uh, uh, specialized models for specialized tasks, more in directions of um, you know combining symbolic and sub-symbolic systems to you know um, rewrite uh, formulations, uh, call uh, engines, uh, do the computation there, and then basically. Uh, maybe the reasoning there and then basically just give back the answer and so on. Um, and this enables many, many uh, advantages uh, uh, from adaptability of, uh, to abstraction, interpretability and other stuff. And I will talk about this in a second. So the way we see it is that uh, uh, we believe that in like what the future computational stack is, uh, we see already some, some emerging factors in that direction that models become smaller and smaller. Obviously GPU is still get bigger and bigger and then more, more potent if you want. So, so uh, at some point as the like JVM in the like Java virtual machine in the stack and you had this like a compiler and so on, we will have at some point uh, every every pocket computer, everything will have in some way or form a neurosymbolic engine in there, which you can use, you know, the sub-symbolic or symbolic interactions between both and then like do the computation and then and, and get more elaborate uh, results. So you can think of it as a more, if you want so a semantically averse uh, parser, if you want so, now that's, that would be a very oversimplified thing. But uh, that 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 could be one one analogy to the to the classical world. Um, so and and uh, there is actually a more inherent futuristic view on what 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 can emerge from this neurosymbolic, uh, at least from our perspective, from this neurosymbolic interactions. 
Because if you think of it this way, if I can borrow the uh, Andrew Kaparfi's, I think, uh, analogy of software 1.0 and software 2.0, um, then you had uh, like the software 1.0 was a classical program where you had formal languages, structured data, tables, and you know all the compilers, things that we see in programs or we program mainly today. Software 2.0 is a more like uh, data-driven approach where we have just raw data. And then we just go end to end, try to learn a function that solves the problem. So we have nice generalization properties. But like a software 3.0 would be this neurosymbolic system. So we're interacting in both worlds and just you know selecting um, uh, basically the the, um, uh, the 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 computation on the engines that are most most robust, and then basically using generalization properties to uh, build up if you want to a computation graph and then execute that computation graph. So. We believe uh, we call this here interaction based, so we could think of it as instance based. Uh, uh, imagine I would just give you one example of an object in the visual spectrum, and I give you exactly one label once. Uh, yeah, try to to learn a function with just one example, it wouldn't work. Uh, also, but still, the variation of that sample could be very, very, very difficult to program hard code something, right? So the idea would be to use the properties of generalization maybe, uh, but the associative power of symbolic systems to you know, combine these two things together. And I will be more concrete in a second. Specifically, what would also be nice is if you can then in the future conceptualize and execute applications at runtime. Think of it like uh, uh, the Van Neumann architecture where you have the central processing unit, random access memory and so on. And you, you do the computation and you know push and pop from a stack as, as actually, uh, also, Leo in, in indicated there. Imagine you could conceptualize a program at runtime. So that means in context conceptualization of a program, and then just all execute that program. So if you would just turn off the neural network, if you want, so uh, just then the entire program is vanished because it has never been actually programmed or never had been actually uh, learned that way. Just through interactions or instances from the outside world, molded towards the kind of program you wanted, or if you want, so you could use the properties of hallucination to, to let's say, if you want the word processor, have a nice tiger skin or whatever in the background because you just change the code at runtime because you just uh, ask it to, to change its uh, representation. So these are things that we kind of see as a future programming stack and which can emerge from this interactions. Um, now, the question is, it's nice to talk about that we can conceptualize and execute programs uh, in the context, but the problem here is, how do we control what's happening? Because we can, we can just generate something and then just execute something, but uh, that doesn't really mean that we are getting somewhere. So how do we, we, we see this control factor? And assume that we have a generative process here. Um, what we want or what we see is basically, if we can just take any time step uh, and just verify variables, maybe use so sub-symbolic systems to verify other sub-symbolic outcomes and results, we could use that for instance, or we could use classical, you know, reg access or properties from uh, symbolic AI to really see if X uh, larger than Y or whatever properties we're verifying. And then if that is violated or not, then we basically just go back, we regenerate that with the new condition and then, you know, do this, this flow until we get somewhere where we want it to get. To be more specifically, um, maybe all of you are kind of familiar with chatbots, uh, especially now with, with ChatGPT and all, all this a way of how it interacts with you. Uh, for us, it was back then a question, how do they actually sometimes give this, get this very nice uh, narrated or scripted answers back in some cases and some not, right? So uh, the way that we, for instance, came up with the idea in, in mid-January and so on, is like having this kind of narrator instructing. So there's actually a free entity interaction in, in place. So the user actually interacting with the system, Symbia, which is now representative as our chatbot, if you want so. Um, and the narrator, which is, I think, now the equivalent of system, what you know now from GPT-4 uh, or from, from the interfaces, what you saw now. So basically, the narrator is just instructing how the, the actual chatbot is, and it's never seen by the user. So it's just instructing how the system should actually respond to words or verify or whatever to leave out or leave in as an information. Um, and... Doing it this way, we, we can now actually have a very nice neurosymbolic flow, uh, flow control because if a condition or something that we applied on is violated, we just call another expression, go back and maybe do another generative path or so. We have just now this, this uh, ability to just unfold and then verify at each step or after some paragraphs or whatever we want to define as an interval, uh, the, the outputs. 
Um, so to conceptualize this entire picture, uh, the entire framework from us, from our perspective, is basically we have a language model with uh, with, with the language interface. So this could be any like uh, Leo already teased uh, type zero to type three language uh, snippets or or parts. Uh, so we just feed this in, in in into the neural network with some instructions, and uh, we will see how these instructions are composed in a, in a second. So based on let's say we have an operation, uh, we, we we feed it some instruction, maybe some payload from the user. Then it computes something, it gives some output, and then we, we place conditions and constraints on the output. And depend, depending on these constraints and conditions, we might call other operations, say, okay, this was not what we wanted, and make a loop out of it. Or we basically just go to uh, uh, some engine or so, and then they call, you know, maybe there was an instruction to search some facts. So that there are some facts in the input space. So we go for a search engine, and then, you know, we use Google in this case, but you could use any what you want. Uh, or we can use OCR or any other things if there are images or some other things uh, like links or some other things involved in the in the query. And the question is now who's controlling all of this right now is it's the user mostly because he has the world knowledge. Uh, but it's not limited to that. You could have uh, we wrote also some scripts if you want, so some demos you can show at the end uh, where you have like a knowledge base where you just execute this in a certain behavior. Uh, but also in the long term, that's the goal. I think where where the most is to gain is this meta learner. You could actually learn this, have an agent controlling this flow, and in, in these interactions, because this is exactly also in line with tool former and maybe other ideas that that uh, kind of merge right now. Um, the question is, how do we uh, prompt this thing, or how do we make these instructions? And and there's actually now this formal language plays uh, a bit of a role. Uh, how how also Leo teased it, because now we illustrate here that this might be some natural language text, but there might be also like a very structured uh, uh, examples, as we always like saw that the few shot examples when we do few shot learning. Uh, it turns out that you can actually build associations through symbols. So for us, everything is a symbol. If you can think of it, it could be a number, it could be a string, it could be even a paragraph if you want so. Could be a hash code if you want to associate some, you know, maybe an image behind some hash code with some other object or symbol. So the idea would be to um, make, let's say, in this case, it's a fuzzy equals uh, uh, instruction here, where we say are the following objects the same? That's like the, if you want, sort of general prompt at the top. And then you give it some few short examples. And what you're kind of shaping right now with this is you're kind of creating like a, a subspace where you kind of give it a notch that one is equal to some like string one. So basically these two things should be treated as equal from now on. Six is equal to this six and so on. Uh, even dates or so you can equate and other things you could basically equate um, with the assumption that generalization takes with, uh, so there are semantic similarities obviously between words and between odd numbers and so on. And uh, models back then we used GPT-3. There was sometimes very well working, sometimes failing. But with GPT-4 and others, uh, it's expected to better and better for all these 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 um, these alignments of these associations. So this is actually very nice now because what we now create is basically we we are having in a way these are like think of it as grammars, but this is just instance based. So we don't know what the grammar actually is here because it might be very complicated to formulate the grammar. But uh, we just say okay, we have multiple instances uh, that we kind of. This is what we want. So we span a subspace, and now from there, this this from here on, this is how the LLM should behave. Um, and the question is, how do we compose them? So the the prompts that we compose is uh, as follows. So if you think about it as a class object from now programming, like I told you, there is soft engineering and machine learning kind of trying to to bring them close to closer together. So we use basically classes as as, as base objects. Uh, which have obviously some global attributes. In this case, we call it uh, static and dynamic contexts, um, which are two, va two variables. So we'll explain this in a second. And then obviously a class has multiple methods um, and where they like the in instructions of the operations are uh, placed in, maybe some examples, how we want to manifold that uh, and even a template if we want to like say, like go from here from this template structure um, onwards. And there's obviously the, the user input with, with some payloads. The payload could be some, from some previous results of execution. Um, you might be familiar with these things as, again, the system, I think it's now called ChatGPT or GPT-4, where you have the system prompts. Uh, 
uh, and then uh, you 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 might have the other one being the user instructions as well, or the computation of the payload, what, what, what you want to have. Um, now, what is the static context, dynamic context, and what, what, why is this uh, fragmented? Uh, the idea here is uh, static context is if you have a class, for instance, you can have, like, say, a SQL class, where in the, in the header of the SQL class, there is the static context defined as you are an SQL uh, statement, so to say. This is how SQL is. There's a query language and there's some ex explanations. There are like from statements that go to databases. There are select projections and so on that, you know, you just describe basically what, what this behavior is of this class. But the, maybe at runtime or without changing the code, if you want. So you might want to say to the user might say, but you know how about the formatting should be different every time when you generate something because I want to have a alphabetic or some other ordering or so. So you give it a dynamic context and can just, this is like, if you reset everything, you don't have this anymore. So it's basically at, at runtime if you want so. Um, now, the other things here are operations because like I said, a class could have multiple operations. SQL, for instance, what does it mean if I add two SQL statements together? So what was the most logical way to add them? So if I give this problem to a human, he will look at it and maybe like think about like, okay, maybe he wants, like I see the same uh, tables, I see the same uh, you know, selections and so on, but they're like, uh, both are different conditions. So maybe the end conditions have to be like, like ended and the, the where statement has to be kind of combined, right? So this is, would be an addition maybe of two SQL statements, but you could have any other operations and then there are multiple operations and, and I will show this in a second. And this is actually the full pipeline, how we we, we use um, uh, or how, how this is composed. So basically we have the user, the user input calling some custom method. Uh, we use a lot of decorators as a design choice. I will elaborate this later on. Uh, and uh, there's like basically from the decorator, some pre-processing is called. So all these blue highlighted things are basically how we compose this system-based uh, um, uh, prompts and all the yellowish things are basically user prompts or payload from previous executions. And then we have basically just passed on to a preprocessor that can reformat the import, uh, then passed into the actual engine. You see this structure here. This is just one choice of this. You could actually have a prepare statement and you can change and wiggle around and turn all, all these things on, on their head as you wish. So you could have at the end, the global context, at the beginning, the user query and whatever you want. Uh, it, it just subclass the engines, and then you get some output out of the LLM. And now we can basically apply the post processor. So you could like trim off, uh, you know, unnecessary spaces, uh, maybe reformat something to, into like capital case, it's lower case or whatever you want, um, and then apply all the constraints and then get the output uh, if everything was successful. Now. Why did we choose all this, this like weird, why do we associate classes and these prompts and so on in, in a way? Well, there is an inherent property from object-oriented programming actually that, that kind of is uh, in, uh, for us now natural, but it's in, in a way very important because abstraction is built in there. So if you think about it this way, as we have also in PyTorch, so we have module and we derive from module, different individual modules, and then we can derive further on. And uh, any of the implementation in the subclasses can have different behaviors, right? So the behaviors shift based on which class you're right now in. So this is the idea also of having animals, mammals, dogs, until to some specific dog. And if you would like bark, or how, what, what would it mean to bark as an animal versus what would it mean to bark as a Shiba dog or whatever, right? So this, this properties we kind of wanted to uh, ingrain into the, the framework where we see that at the top there's a symbol. Everything is, could be a symbol. It could be an image. You could put whatever you want in it. Um, you just have to find, a, if you want to process it by an LLM, have to find a, a string representation that kind of preserves the information, right? So if it's an image, well, it might be not efficient if you just flatten out the image. So you might want to use a hash code or something else if you want to process with that. Um, but then you basically just derive from there the expression, which adds some functionalities. This was just design choice. And from here, every other class is basically derived from. So you can have a styling uh, expression, you can have a compose expression, templating, and so on. Uh, SQL expressions, whatever you want. So this is kind of the, the inherent hierarchy. And the nice property or idea is here, uh, this, this propagation of how methods behave. Like I told you, I derived from expression now as SQL expression. Before I had maybe no context how to add two uh, SQL statements together. Now that just I give a description at the top level uh, static context. Now uh, 
context-based the addition of two, two um, uh, SQL statements makes suddenly sense or the LLM can at least associate what it would mean for, for it to, to do this computation. Um, and now if we have so individual expressions, we can actually, what we can do is now chain these expressions to, to get together. So uh, what we do is basically like ch uh, chained operations where we say that actually, if we have like a query like this, Marvin's uh, has four pounds and likes to meow when it put, uh, when I pet its fur, for instance, is Marvin a cat? What we actually can do is now take this natural language text and, you know, take the first expression maybe, uh, extract entities and relationships. So basically we extract cat, fur, meow, so all these properties from, from the sentence. We can actually feed that in into the next expression, which does maybe a formal uh, formulate and higher order logic expression from that. So basically it takes in the original one, this context extraction, extracted version and builds up something like a logical expression um, with, with functionalities feeds it in and maybe then says, okay, now place in the, the query at hand, execute that, and then basically get a result and then just rewrite to the, the result to the, to the user. So what we did here is basically the, we, we decomposed the problem that was at the beginning, with, which required reasoning. Keep in mind that this was at the time of GPT-3, uh, where like reasoning, it was very limited. You could have tripped it off in, in various ways. So the idea was, how do you make it more potent? Basically, you just you know decompose it more fine-grained steps that you can verify, check, and try it out, and then basically you come to the solution, which in a statistical manner might have not worked, for instance, right? So that that is kind of the idea. But how do you might you might ask now? How do you know what meows is a function? Or what does it like? What does it mean to evaluate furry? Uh, well, the idea here is that you. Uh, the assumption here is that you have a knowledge base maybe of all the functions, a symbolic uh, knowledge base where you have all the functions defined at a sub-symbolic representation or some, some uh, you know, hard-coded whatever interpret interpretation. Um, and then basically you could, you just, you know, have access to that knowledge base, look at it, and also have access to the language model with the instructions so it can associate which, which of these things are uh, uh available which not and if things are not available and it doesn't it says like i don't know what to do with it or it just skips it for instance there are some limitations obviously um so the idea now is how does this fully connect to go around circle with, with formal grammars and 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 uh what is it wh why do we actually need symbolic like where do we need new symbolic this is maybe one question again because maybe in the future, just scale up again, data scale up model, and you know everything works better. Logic reasoning works better. Um, well, we still doubt that because one of the things that also Leo tangented on is um, basically the the memory. So it, basically, if you look at the paper from here, DeepMind, um, what they analyzed is, for instance, transformers. If you just have transformers with uh, with uh, feed forward neural networks. Uh, you have just a limited attention span, basically, and actually what you can only process is in that attention span, uh, regular uh, language tasks, if you want, so, so uh, regular context uh, language tasks. If you want to have, let's say, context-sensitive languages uh, to process that, imagine you want to write a book, for instance, uh, you might not want to write every time about your protagonist, but somewhere you want to write about it, and at the end you want to write about him, but in the meantime, maybe not, depending on the context, right? Your, your story should evolve, but you don't want to forget your protagonist, right? Because it just ev evaporates. So what you need is kind of like an external memory where you can put, put it on a stack or whatever, and then you pop from that again when you need it based on the current uh, operations that you're kind of uh, performing. In a way, if you think of it, it's like we humans do. We we like uh, we don't know all the things by heart, but we know where to look it up. And if we need some information now to look the details up, then you know just go to Wikipedia or whatever, read it there, read a paper, come back, note some details down, and then go from there with the computation that we actually do right now. So, um, and this is actually a neat thing that it translates to to if you want to so the state machines, um, because there's an inherent connection here. And the way we see it, and this is actually current research, oh, sorry, current research that we're doing, is we're trying to to equate this to symbolic dynamics, uh, if, if you want so. Uh, so where we say that we have this uh, this um, uh, dynamic system, actually, because if you have a neural network and you just change their operations and just unfold the system, if you want so, um, you you didn't actually want to study its behavior and want to study 
uh, it's symbolic orbits. So from one symbol, so discrete state to another, how you unfold and, and uh, you end up from one state to another, basically, uh, with each token that you produce, feed in again in the input space and so on. Um, there is actually also some, some work that uh, Stephen Wolfram and so on published, uh, so like some blog posts, uh, where he called it like the semantic laws of motion for, for neural networks, which we find kind of interesting, but it's still like open research. And this is like interesting research that we're also looking at right now. Uh, is there a way to, like I told you, when you condition the model, you kind of create a cone in the space or in the subspace. And if you chain these things together, multiple like subspaces, and you kind of have like a semantic motion. And the idea would be to have uh, a, a way to control this, this path that we, we're taking because now we can as i said before conceptualize a program and still have like guarantees where we're moving through the program and then like execute a very very um structured way of, of this program but so far it's this is how do you measure it there are multiple open questions and research problems here um and now to take this again this picture in mind and i said that there is a meta learner here involved right so how does this actually look like? Well, the idea would be that there is an agent that can, uh, you know, in its current attention span, work and buy some instructions or, or do some operations based on some context with the neural symbolic system, and then basically do the computation of, let's say, a very large data stream, uh, and you know, push and pop from some external memory. So it could be a knowledge graph, it could be whatever external memory where it kind of like pushes information from, but it kind of knows a key or so how to retrieve information again, right? It's like the same, same way when we store information, we save papers and whatever, we kind of know the titles, the authors, or some, some property, we know that we can retrieve the information again. Uh, and what I, for instance, don't do anymore is, is paper uh, or pen and paper because I cannot search there, for instance, and all, all the, the notes are usually lost if they get too large. So that, that is how at least I or others uh, uh, operate. And this is like the idea, can we train and optimize a meta agent that can also learn to you know, do all these interactions, select the tools and how to store and retrieve information. This is I think valuable research that is also eased with, with our framework. And now everything from here on is gonna be just practical examples. Um, so it's basically, how does the framework look and work like? Uh, so we have this, this operations as we see here, for instance, and um, I told you there's a base class symbol and symbol has already some default uh, operators uh, implemented. One of them being this end operator, for instance. So if you have two uh, string expressions, like the horn only sounds on Sunday and I hear the horn, then you could have like an implication. So there are multiple examples how implications might look like. <coughs> oh, sorry. And but the result it, uh, out of this computation would be it is Sunday as an implication, for instance. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, another one was the. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, for fuzzy equals example, uh, where we have. <clears throat> I just caught a cold a few days ago, so sorry. <clears throat> uh, one is smaller and equals to one in a string form, uh, which is evaluated as true. The other one would be maybe equating uh, NumPy with some approximation of, of Pi. So what, what basically will be evaluated here, everything that is not a symbol will be converted to a symbol um, and then, you know, uh, prompted and composed together in, in that the LLM can process this. So when you say like 3.1415 without any further context, the most uh, assumable thing would be that this is Pi probably, uh, if, if you would see that even as a human, right? So without any other context around it. Um, other things are, which are very interesting, which you maybe also saw with auto GPT and so on more lately and got quite of hyped um, is like a try execute expressions. So what you have here is like an executable code. This is the execute expression, which just runs code. Um, and the try expression, which catches code and like re-instructs and analyzes the results. And you know, if something goes wrong, sends it back to the LLM. And obviously you can chain these things together. Um, so the idea would be if you have some, let's say like this syntax error prone code here, um, then you try to do this cast, which will fail. Uh, when you evaluate this, basically then you, it tries to reprompt and say, well, this is the cast failed. So it, what is the most uh, viable solution? And then it will manage to figure out that uh, the comma was uh, wrong placed and so on. Um, and also the most, one of the most prominent or known um, 
examples is in the word to vec example with king minus man plus woman, but in the vector space, or, or like in the in, in the in the um, uh, embedding space, how we do this computation, which is kind of hard to interpret, right? So the idea was, is it possible to create prompts or instructions that kind of without having this specific example in there? To, to create something like that, that this computation becomes feasible or in, understandable for the LLM and it at least works with uh, some similar examples, princesses and other things. Um, there is also now, how do we construct custom operations? It's actually very easy. So this would be like how we use our equals or fuzzy equals uh, um, operation. We use actually decorators for that. Um, why we use decorators is because we want to leave always the, the implementation part uh, available for the for the user of our framework. So actually, if the LLM, for instance, doesn't work right now or is not available or whatever, then there should be always able to be a fallback on classical code. So you could just have the implementation space empty. If you implement something there, then if the fallback is the implementation. If not, then an exception is thrown through. Well, that's That's kind of the philosophy here. Um, and how does this look like? It's basically uh, equals is just a more specific version of the few shot uh, uh, decorator where we have, uh, you know, prompts as the most elaborate uh, string here. And, and then like different kind of prompts with, with examples, a list of examples that are basically behind that. Uh, we can have some constraints put on this, which are callables. We have defaults. Um, uh, we can also define a default in the in the decorator directly instead of having an implementation. Uh, some limit of how many results you might want to get back. The pre and post processor, which you saw in the pipeline, how this is executed. So this is basically the the whole uh, magic behind it. So what you can now do is there's also a zero shot, which just does, has no examples with this constraint. So if you want to build a get a random int uh, int generator, a little if it's feasible or but just as a demonstration, um, you can just instruct it like this and put some constraints on it. And also the return type is a constraint. So basically it makes it very easy to just, you know, say one annotation, some examples, or it's just a constraint. And then just, this is how the, the LLM is instructed. You might ask now, what, what's the difference maybe to LangChain or any other things that you can, can do? Well, my question would be also in the directions of, um, uh, I mean, you can do everything with C, with C++ maybe nowadays, right? You can, you don't need Python or any other uh, higher uh, order languages, but the amount of meta codes that builds around the same thing you want to just execute maybe with one line in Python uh, might quickly explode in, 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 in dimensions if you go down to C or to even to uh, further down the, the, the alley, right? So basically this is one way of how we also see it. We want to have as, at least meta code as, as necessary uh, and the easiest way to to just instruct or create functions and expressions that really do some specific task like generating Japanese names and with some limitations constraints and so on maybe even with some uh, dummy implementation if if the model is not available uh, yeah the, the one of the last things uh, just to two three more examples and I will um, cut it um, are, for instance, we can build streams. I told you that we want to, you know, have the stream of, of um, um, if, if we have a larger uh, data set that we want to process, which is larger than the context of the model, what we kind of came up with the idea is to, to come to chunk it up, right, and do stream processing similar in a way to um, to uh, PyTorch, where you can open a sequence, a sequence of operations, right? And then now each chunk is independently operated with this uh, with this sequence. Uh, and then afterwards you can cluster things together again or do other expressions or even chain together. Like, like I told you, if you had some computations prior to that and pass in a payload and you know uh, query that payload, if you, for instance, want to ask for something from an OCR text. Um, yeah, we have also a lot of many, many tools. Uh, yeah, I can look at it if you want some shell tools which you can play around with. Um, this was the SQL example that I showed you or explained to you already earlier, where you have the SQL class, an object from the SQL class. Now you pass in natural language text. And the cool part is it, you know, just converts that to SQL, but now you can do operations on that uh, result, that query, right? So what you can do is shift information in where it's contextualized the shifting, not just appended or so. So it basically knows now, because it knows it's an SQL expression, how to contextualize it, convert that into this expression. 
and um, yeah, and and then basically maybe subtract information again or convert it even to other uh, query languages. Um, this is how we actually have the basis, the conditioning for our chatbot that is also a bit baked in there, where you can maybe separate between things like mathematics, where we call Wolfram Alpha, where we can separate between linguistic problems or maybe, I don't know, search engine requests or so, where we make conditions and just, you can go as fine-grained as you want. So we just use this uh, is instance off and then ask if, if it's instance of mathematics or something else. And then it basically uh, just, you know, goes into that path. And then from there we can, uh, rewrite the, the statement in a way that, that is maybe compatible with or from alpha or something else. This is the example of the chatbot, which is just easy, like Symbia, which is easily derived from chatbot expression, which is from expression derived and so on. Um, and there is a nice function in there, narrate, like I told you before. This is how you instruct it to just tell you what it wants you to tell. So the user interacts with the system and this is how it narrates back. Uh, and then if the, it does some computation like uh, chit chat or math problem or so, you can pass it on a context, a payload, and then it, it will just rewrite that information. And these are basically the options. So you use actually also the in-context uh, few short examples to classify the input. So that's also, you can dynamically grow this list or whatever you want to manipulate the list. So you actually can expand the capabilities of the model at runtime. That's, that's one of the, the things that I told you before with, with the uh, conceptualizing and growing the application. The question is who, who steers that right now? And that's where we're heading at, saying that we want the meta learner to, to learn this kind of behaviors. And if you go full circle, you can make very elaborate expressions, generate entire news websites, summary websites. This is from CNNBC, uh, where I just fetch the data from the URL. It's, it's like 18,000 whatever tokens or so there because it's like just a dump of the website. But then I summarize everything because I stream process it, cluster things together again because you want to have related news at the same spot and then compose new text template. So I template HTML first and then I do a styling. So this is how you could generate an entire website uh, really on spot how you want it and not just having like in ChatGPT, if you ask it, you might get some text at the beginning. You have to go back and forth all the time to get where you want to get, right? That. Um, yeah, and the neat thing about this expression would be also you can trace and debug because what you have now is this chained operations and you can look at even like a stack trace of what, what kind of operations happened there, right? And, and how, how, was, how this was executed. Yeah, thank you for, for bearing through um, um, and for your attention. Sorry for taking a bit longer than expected um, and uh, looking forward to questions. Hopefully there are still this time for questions. Yeah, thanks, Maris. I think we can leave it at this slide so people can scan and see your repository while we do the Q&A. So maybe we have 15 to 20 minutes of q and I just want to highlight uh, whatever workflow that Maris described actually bears striking resemblance to AutoGPT. Like you have a starting task, you break down into subtasks, use the neural symbolic architecture to find the right tool to use, then proceed to use the tool. And then after that, go back again to the engine, find what's the next tool and so on until you solve it. So um, the way that they process the symbols here, they kind of use the LM few shot or zero shot prompting to decide like what symbol to use and like whether the symbols are equals to each other. So I think that's quite interesting. So maybe I, I would like to just maybe ask the first question first uh, while the rest of y'all can think of the question. So my question is quite simple. Like why should we go into the symbol level as compared to just you know, describing what you want into a large language model like ChatGPT, why do we need to bother with, with extracting out the symbols and putting those symbols explicitly into the code, like um, your code? So maybe you could give some insight. Uh, thank you. Good, great question. So the, the, the thing is, um, what we see is you, you want to have control. Like reasoning is one of the, the, the main points, right, that we are also heading towards. So we have nice reasoning engines. We have, uh, you know, symbolic solvers and all the, the stuff that we developed, uh, the, you know, the entire history of, of, of computer science. So now we're just kicking everything away. And we're, we're, we're saying like, uh, we're, we're treating now the large language models like oracles, right? We give it one uh, query and hope that the, the best, like the result is uh, what we get out of it is, is correct. But if you think about it, 
you, you can create, create many very complicated statements and then you see that rules can trip it off and then, you know, because there is no reasoning really baked in. It's like part of it might emerge for statistical, you know, representations, but you want to have control of, of your program. So specifically now, if you go in directions of automating these things, so you, you don't want it because it's just right now the data set, there was a weak connection between two types of uh, associations. Uh, it just, when it sees that word or so you prompt hacked it that way, then you basically just end up uh, a walking the, the, the model with all the results. And imagine you have like a very really elaborate computation, which goes in many loops and so on, right? Your entire application quote unquote crashes then, right? So the idea here is to kind of bring both worlds together and having these objects and symbols that we can, especially for abstraction and so that we can assign to and say that these are kind of related in a way or another. And then we can verify also on them, right? Because you can say like, we have these symbols now in the system. Are they related with the systems that we can verify? Like you now uh, how we actually do it. When you have a formula, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. when, when you do, uh, you're not a walking computer. I'm not a walking computer. I cannot do the square root of 1.375, whatever in my head. But I know how to write. If I tell you this in the textual form, I know how to rewrite it in the formula, use a calculator, and then I can verify the results and everything, right? So I can see that the computation worked. And I don't have to hope that the LLM kind of worked with it properly, right? Yeah, thanks. So actually, I played around with this architecture uh, quite a bit. And I talked to like the Symbia, the chatbot. So it's quite cool because you can literally just type in anything and the chatbot can infer in the right like symbolic architecture. Like if you want to do calculation, it can refer you to from alpha maybe like solve some uh, quadratic equation. You're going to find out like what's the weather in Singapore. I, I tried it out. Mm -hmm. You can search the web and get the information for you. So um, there's some benefit of grounding it in symbols because uh, I mean, in this case, symbols can also be tools because in this case, a symbol can encompass the entire tool like for two formal or like Visual Chat GPT, we talked about tools back then. Mm -hmm. One symbol is actually a tool. But more importantly, this symbol can also be those kind of logical inference kind of symbols. You can run logical inference tools. You can also use like calculators and so on. So it, it is very, very versatile, um, the whole notion of symbols here. And you, you can just program in whatever you want. Like you can, so I, I myself have played a bit. Yeah, so I, I think it's quite interesting. Oh yes, sorry, and anyone was talking? Maybe also from a physics perspective, uh, just to do also give you this. If you have a physical system already, you can basically couple that and associate that and use that engine where you do the computation, where you have everything like worked out in the simulation of the physics system and come back to the uh, language rep or symbolic representation. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyone else would like to ask? Maybe you can take three to four questions. Hi, uh, I have a question here. First, thanks for the presentation. So I just, uh, before the question, I just want to check my understanding first. So if my understanding is correct, um, so here you have to um, hard code um, what, how do I, for what kind of tasks, which kind of, uh, uh, let's say we have interface, the language model with different uh, plug-in. So different, maybe symbolic way to solve problem. So here we have to hard code for what kind of problem I uh, I need to use, uh, which kind of plugins, is that the case? So uh, thank you for the question. So for now, uh, if you want to interface with some system or so, obviously you have to, to implement it because we have no, there is no system yet learned that can automate that process. Uh, but the idea, of course, on the long run would be that imagine you could give uh, one of the subroutines you could program as an expression would be uh, read an interface, read, for instance, a documentation and so on, and connect the best way based on this condition, on this context, try to, to find functions that best interface with that uh, documentation, right? Like uh, trying to post something on social media and then just reading over the documentation of the Twitter API and then coming up with functions. So, but what you need now is we need to have, first of all, data sets. Um, in our opinion, we need data sets that kind of uh, are not like, like I told you, we have retina data sets that usually get a prompt as an input and uh, directly we try to infer the, the answer out of that. 
So this is how, how we treat the chat GPT for a long time, where we just gave it a query and then like the most natural way to answer that. We struck, we put all the information in the wait space. Uh, what we now need is something like more data sets that kind of have this thought processes. This What we then can turn, train a meta learner that kind of follows these thoughts, the, this chain of thoughts. When I want to program a website, for instance, I think of, okay, which programming language? Okay, where... Uh, where do I download the newest version? And there are many questions that I ask myself. Is the specification in, uh, detailed enough? Do I have to ask my client back and then ask him again, hey, wait, what kind of website is cooking, whatever? Uh, and, you know, after I've worked out all these questions and answers to it, so I put all of these things on the stack, if you want so, then I go from that and then I go trial and error maybe with some things from Google, try to template and so on and, and, and move forward in this way. But we don't have models that do this kind of stepwise uh, thinking, first of all, and then like trying to think, work these things out. And in this way, uh, we kind of need data sets for something like that, in my opinion. And we need then ways to isolate the systems to trial, trial and error, execute stuff, because I don't want to have a model A walk on my machine with, with hardware, uh, with, with uh, access to my SSD or whatever, where it's reckons every all in my entire system. When it tries things out, I so see. this is like things that we still need to to develop. Uh, yeah. So the reason I ask this is because my one of my concern is if we let's say in the future when it's become when the large large language model become even more uh, capable of solving complicated question, then maybe for some question it is even not clear what kind of tools it need to use. So maybe we we have to let it to even strategize how to or even select what kind of tools to use. So uh, if that's the if that's the context, then yeah, then yeah, I don't know. Like I, I feel like uh, explicitly uh, telling them what to use in which case might not be uh, very scalable. So yeah, if I if I may, yeah, I was say the, if I may, the, the plan to um to build a strategy right, to attack a problem piecewise you mentioned the lack of a proper data set um, my working model is enterprises and so on and they're very complex beasts nobody really knows how they work what kind of data sets would be appropriate to come up with those complex plans for a largely poorly understood environment where you've got these symbolic approaches, call them APIs, call them applications, people, processes, whatever. But how would you break that down? How would you represent that as a data as as a data set that you could approach that problem? So what I, for instance, liked uh, was when I watched Open Assistance, for instance, a uh, uh, video with uh, Yannick, for instance, he kind of, when he went and uh, showed up basically how he collects data now with his, with their framework and so on. Um, but what I liked is when he was like asking some, some question about, uh, you know, Red Fox and some, some property, what it can or cannot do. I forgot the details, but the point was he was asking himself all the time, sort of self-ask if you want so, uh, wait, what can it do? What, what can this uh, Fox do? And then was going on Google, going on Wikipedia and all this thought process that he actually put in there was is in the end lost because what he had done is it result basically was just the input of the prompt basically what was the original question and then the output was the was the most uh, elaborate answer to that to that question but that intermediary that thought process that re chain of re uh, chain of thought if you want so uh, that is kind of the data set that. I am still uh, vouching for, or I'm vouching for, that we can use that as a conditioning for, for the models to, to come up also with these uh, logical thoughts. And also what, why I say also this, why do we tie this so, so tightly together to these expressions and this uh, object orientation? Because there are also relationships baked in already. When we think about object orientation, we have this abstraction of interfaces and then the more and more concrete implementations. The properties that emerge from the more concrete implementations are in a way reflecting what we actually think, how we abstract the world all the time. And we need maybe this bias also somewhere in, in our data set that we can say this is more abstract version of this data set and so on. So this might be also property that we that we bring in abstraction in a, in a more profound way.
Thank you. Sorry, Leo, you wanted to say something? Mm, yeah, I think to. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, initially, before before Richard uh, asks his question, there is this problem of open endedness, <clears throat> which touches exactly uh, uh, what I, I don't I don't I haven't seen uh, his name, but it's exactly what uh, uh, open endedness uh, touches, uh, which is to say that um, you can explore so you you penalize uh, more the exploitation explo exploitation and you leave the exploration phase uh, uh kind of unrestricted to to come up with uh, with with different uh behaviors so you can you can try to for example the way i imagine this is like uh the way you would uh, ssh into a virtual machine so in that virtual machine you have like a reserve space of, of of what you can do ultimately, so you would not broke your system uh, into there. But you can, for example, open something like a virtual machine, and inside that virtual machine, you can basically let this open NS process to explore how it come up with different. Uh, I don't know what tool should it use, and so on. And you just catch those expression if if your virtual machine dies because it did something stupid you just restart it from scratch so you won't lose anything so this ties a little bit to, to the to the point of sim, of running simulations the simulations you cannot break in a way so that's very useful so this is the way i think about it and probably somebody at some point will actually take this exact idea to use virtual machines to run uh, this this things in that virtual machine which you cannot break so uh yeah and, and the second point to 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 add to what mario said uh, to you richard there's also this new model the dolly 2 which was basically a model trained on um on instructions to follow instructions you can think of it uh, as being a similar problem so reinforcement learning through uh, from human feedback it's it's a very powerful technique you can apply it everywhere you can apply it to even build a data set that would display this uh, capacity of, of of chain of thought that Marius talked about nothing stops it from doing this it's like all, all you need is to to annotate this data now someone will do this i mean you will be interested to find out if it works right so you have all the tools you you have instruct gpt paper the way they train the GPT models, and so you have everything. You just need the data. And obviously, why would be chain of thought, I mean, in terms of an assumption that you can make, why would be chain of thought uh, different than following instructions? After all, a chain of thought is like a meta instruction. It's like the uh, what Mario said that Janic, Janic did was basically a, a metacognitive aspect, right? You ask yourself questions. How do I get unstuck? what should i do here these are these are all things that you can capture in a data set and you can even put domain expertise right because obviously it it, it is different from from a lawyer to a programmer a programmer would do things differently a lawyer would do things differently a medic would do things differently so you just add domain expertise from uh, each one of these domains from physics from math from everywhere and you just build this 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 chain of thought data set. This is obviously possible. It is just a matter of I would say time until people probably open AI is already working on this kind of stuff. But again, you need a domain expertise, so you you have to tackle it uh, one domain at a time. You cannot take all the data. You just let's solve code first, right? Because code seems the most accessible. Then let's solve uh, law. Then let's solve and so on. Because you have this neural engine, which is very powerful. You already have it. You just need the alignment to uh, whatever your task is going to be. So in, in my case, I, I definitely see this possible. It's like probably just under the corner. So one more thing to, to also to that. Um, why? So you, you saw so from the previous image that you that I showed you where you had like the language model, but then also the meta learner uh, having this chain of thoughts. 
you can also think of it the meta learner is kind of how kind of operate at different time scales so because the problem of the language model is just i mean it has to follow instructions right but it has no how do you verify the output that's one of the largest problems here because imagine if it's the natural text natural language text so how do you verify natural language text semantics right so what a meta learner for instance could do is basically set times uh, uh, like goals or so milestones having where you want to generate to end up in the end, right? Some intermediate steps and so on, and maybe the, the next, you know, operation that you execute. And then you basically just verify if A and B are associatable, right? And are kind of connected or not. And if not, then obviously the meta learner, like we would look at a result and say, wait, this is kind of off. It's not what I would have expected, right? From the, from the computation. Uh, so that is something that, that also I think is, is, necessary for a data set to to uh, and and why we why I believe two kind of maybe two RLHF uh, differently trained models one just follows instructions the other other one has like this guidance and strategy and, and planning and in, in, as an as a baked in data set okay maybe I'll read out a question from Evan uh, he asks if he wants to implement uh, natural language processing questions in symbolic AI for example, like he's very interested in syllabification, like to split a word into syllabus. Uh, how can he do it in your framework? Uh, you mean like just creating an operation that's using basically the, the decorators, as I showed earlier. Um, so just creating syllables, basically, I would, I would just create an expression just derived from yeah, in this case, it's symbol, but you could drive from expression and then, then basically just uh, give a few shots or examples uh, how you want to instruct the model to behave. And then you can have it as an input, um, the because also the, the input is variable, the, the, the definition of the, um, of the decorators can vary. There's in the documentation, I think, many examples how, how you, they show them, how you can create such instructions. Yeah, you you just replace in this case get random integer with uh, get syllab uh, syllabus or and, and so on, and you just have this prompt that would guide the model on how to do syllabus. And this shouldn't be a hard problem because you have the basically the the way GPTs were trained was using a BP encoder, which is a way to to chunk uh, and, and segment words and and keep parts that are more common. So it should be a very straightforward task, I, I would say. Maybe even even as a comment here, because maybe this is already one of the things that that already would benefit a lot if you have data sets in this line of thought. Because um, I kind of like his question. It is not guaranteed that it works. It's basically if you shotting a model, hoping that what you are querying it is aligned with somewhere in the data set of the RLHF, right? Um, so if you want the first steps, how to improve also not only our framework, but in general uh, alignment with how, like, let's say we have now this hierarchical structure of, of symbol expressions, SQL and other properties. And all of these like operators that are baked in there should behave in a certain way. So if I would tell you add two strings together, you probably first thought would be just concatenating them. Uh, if I would tell you add two SQL statements together, like I told you before, you, you would say that's weird to concatenate two SQL statements. So probably if you look at the, the individual properties of it, you would say, okay, maybe he wants to just add the where clause uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. And these things are, are queries that that not that can happen and work well if if it's abundant available in a data set but doesn't have to always work well because maybe the association was never built uh, this way, right? And there are many cases where we can probably sleep over many models, uh, even GPT-4 and so on, which is more capable than GPT-3 what we had back then. So um, that would be already the first step. How would you approach it from more elaborate data set to, to follow these alignments that even understands these abstractions and operations at different levels of abstraction, right? That would be already one of the data sets that I would wish for. Yeah, and, and to, to add uh, to what Mario said, uh, for example, you have this this context that each, uh, each large language model has, right? And there is work that basically uh, came up with evidence for the fact that 
uh, you can uh, so reinforcement learning from human feedback is a way to align your model to human preferences. So you can view that thing as a semantic prior, right? But they found out that with the context of, of, of this model and the way you are, you are doing in context learning and the few shots and the zero shots, and especially the few shots in which you give him example, give it example, then there is a very, it's a very likely, uh, a very likely thing that you might observe is that you can basically um, shift those semantic priors that were initially put into the model. So actually, you might uh, literally escape from those semantic priors. So you you probably saw a, a quick example here. You probably saw what happened to 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 uh, Sydney uh, with Bing's uh, chatbot that you can access right now at the beginning, there was a, a guy who, who came and he basically just, um, through the way he prompted the, uh, the uh, Sydney, it, it just make it reveal the entire uh, instruction set. So that was a way to basically uh, shift that semantic priors, which was actually exactly those instructions in which you could find out that you shouldn't reveal this information to any user. You actually bypass that and pull that information out. So within context, you might be able to, to, to shift those semantic priors that uh, Marius said they are induced through uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. It's it's possible, and especially with larger contexts, as you we would get with GPT-4, it's 32K or something like this, it's even more likely so for you to shift that initial priors. All right, I think there's a good point to end because we kind of overshot already. Uh, just want to highlight, uh, so this symbolic AI framework is still not complete. Um, there's still a lot more improvements that could be made. Uh, if you all have any like interest to help to make more like symbol interactions to interface with more engines, right? Feel free to contact either Leo or Marius and then we can build on this together. So this is more or less like an alternative, I would say, to like the current auto GPT models, Langchain. I mean, it also can use tools. It interprets the output in terms of like symbols. You can interface symbols with each other using some large language model to guide it to see whether is it fuzzy equals or in the NLP case, you can add in some few short prompting using LM to like generate the syllabification. So at least that's my understanding. That, that's correct, right? Yep. So yes. yeah. Yeah, if you all like to contribute more, um, feel free to, to scan this QR code here and help to contribute to the repository. If not, I would like to thank um both Leo and Marius for the very interesting presentation today. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. And we'll I'll just refer to both of them. All right. If not, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks so much. And I'll see you. Thank around. you, John. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye. Thanks for presenting.